Hello everyone and welcome to the second lesson of the first chapter of the second book of the art journey series. Actually it's not the whole second lesson, I mean this was supposed to be lesson 2 video with the first half being the lecture and the other half the exercise part like we usually do. But the fundamental series is just too big to cram all this information in one hour video. So it went from one video for lesson 2 to a one lecture video and one exercise video. Then the exercises went from 5 to 25 to 100. So now we have one lecture video and five exercise videos. But while I'm writing the script for the lecture video, it turns to 60 pages of information. So it needs to be at least four to five hours to fit it all in. So now we have four lecture videos and five exercise videos for one single lesson in chapter one of the second book of the Art Journey series. I think I'm gonna be 200 years old when I'm done with this series. So for now, this is the first part of the second lesson of the first chapter of the second book of the Art Journey series. After that, will come three more parts for the lecture and five parts for the exercise videos. So hang in there buddy, this is gonna be a long, long ride. In this series, as you know, we talk about the fundamentals of art. We are still talking about light and value painting. And in this lesson, we're gonna pick up where we left off from the previous lesson. But this time we're gonna start painting more and more complicated shapes and add more complicated light direction to build on the previous lesson. In the previous lesson, we talked about light, light types, directions, time of day, and anything related to it. Then we talked about the value scale and adding values to basic shapes. We also talked about calculating shadows for different conditions and light type. And we did two video exercises on different type of objects and different direction of light. In this lesson, we're going to talk about painting values into your scene. And just like the previous lesson, this is the lecture video. But unlike the previous ones, this comes with five exercise videos to cover painting values on all types of shapes. We will talk more about them at the end of this video. So let's talk now about what I'm gonna cover in the lecture part of this lesson. We're gonna cover the major factors that affect your value. These factors will affect where and how much light will be distributed as a value all around your painting and how your values will look like. Understanding them will give you the power to control where and how you place these factors to get the required look and focal point to guide your viewer and tell a story with only light and values. I'm going to talk first about the direction of the light and its effect on the scene values. And with all these sections, we are going to look at many examples with each of them as well. Either an example from master art, photograph, and everything in between. And along with that, I will paint a couple of examples for each to hammer the point down. Next, I'm going to talk about weather, as in sunlight versus clouds, for example. And then we're going to talk about intensity, types of light, light bouncing, surface normal, surrounding reflectivity, basic colors and materials, minor and major keys, edges, ambient occlusion, and finally composition. We have a lot to cover, so let's just dive in. But before we dive in, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and leave a comment down below. So why does the direction of the light affect your values? In this example, we can see this basic shape with three different polygons or surfaces. Each of these surfaces is pointing at a different direction. We can see here the yellow arrow point at the surface normal of that face. The surface normal is the vector which is perpendicular to the surface at a given point, or simply the direction which the surface is facing. Now if we place the light on the top right position, we can see the photons or the light rays hit each surface at a different angle. If we consider that the surface isn't a dark or light surface, more of a mid-tone, when the light hit the middle section due to the direction of the light and the surface normal, we are going to have the light hit directly at zero degree angle in between the light ray and the surface normal. Or in another way, we are going to have the light ray hit the surface at 90 degrees. When that happens, this part of the surface will have the lightest light of the whole object. And since the object have a mid-tone value as a basic value, it will be around 2 or 3. If you looked at the top part of the object, we see that the light hit at a 45 degrees, which will give it a lower value than the mid section, since it's only hitting at half strength than the other part. Let's say it will give it a value of 5. As for the lowest part, due to the direction of the surface normal, 
The ray of light will hit it at a 60 degree angle, which will be even lower than the top section. But since this is a mid-tone object and the light still hits it, it won't go lower than 6, which is still a lower mid-tone value rather than a shadow value. And as you can see, the direction of the light is a major factor in distributing values around an object. But that's not the only factor of course here, because we also have the surface normal and the intensity of light, but we will cover those later as well. For now let's see how the direction of the light changed these values we just saw. If we move the light to the top side, at a 90 degrees angle perpendicular on the top surface we will shift the lightest value from the middle section to the top one, since it's a 0 degree now with its surface normal. Now you may have noticed that the value here is not 3 like before, but 2. The reason why is the distance between the first light and the mid section was longer than this light and the top section. See, not only direction affects the values, but the distance of the light source as well. It has something to do with the decay of the light source, or the amount of intensity your light source emits the light toward your object. It's another factor that I'm gonna talk about later. Now if this was the sunlight, there would be no decay, and your object will be at the value of 2 in both cases. But since this is a light source, it's a bit closer here so it will affect the surface a bit more than in the previous example. As for the mid section, here we have a 45 degree angle, but as with the top surface the value is not 5, it's 4, since it's also a bit closer to the light source for the reason we just talked about a minute ago. So what about the last part? This time it's at 90 degree with the surface normal, or 0 degree with the surface itself. So it's basically not being hit by the light at all. So now it goes over to the low value section and become a shadow. But since the basic value is gray not black, the shadow won't go all the way to absolute black, but more of a value of a 7 or 8. So what if we did the same thing but move the light source to the bottom right? It's still as close as the one before, so the value shift to the new light location. The bottom part is now at 0 degree, so it's become the value of 2. The mid section is still the same at 45 degrees, so it's still at 4. And now the top part isn't being hit by the light, so it's about a value of 7. So as you can see in these three examples, light direction is a major factor in deciding where your values are distributed around your object. To see how that would look like on a more complicated example, let's look at this famous Asaro head. This is a geometrical representation for the planes of the head, so this will make it really easy to see the effect of light on a human head, but in a very few planes instead of a complicated organic surface. In the first example we see that the light source is on the top side of the head. It's a bit higher than it looks here, it's a bit outside the canvas. Let's use all the values here from 1 all the way to 9. As you can see the value scale is on the right and the value indication showing how it's going light from the top all the way to the dark in the bottom. Depending on the surface number of the head, we can see the distribution of the light values on the head starting from the closest surface on the top that are at 0 degree with the light, and changes in values at this surface normal change direction. When these planes rotate from 0 to 90, the values change with it. So we can see the top of the head, the bridge of the nose, and the top of the ears are at 1 to 4 values, whereas the cheeks, the jaw, and the side of the head are at 4 to 6. The eyes being in the shadow, they range between 6 and 8. The light value that are in those shadow area are mostly reflected light hitting the white floor and reflecting back at the planes facing the ground. So here the white ground acts as a secondary light source that affects the surface facing it. Finally we have the shadow areas that doesn't face either the top light source or the ground and those are around the neck and the bottom lip at a value of 7 to 9. When we shift the light source to the left all those values shift with it and the value distribution shift from the top to bottom toward the left to right. All the areas that were facing the top side now go into the mid values, and the one facing the left goes to the light values. By the same token, everything on the right now become in the shadow. But those shadows aren't as dark as before since lots of these right side planes also face a 45 degree or so with the ground surface which also act like a lesser secondary light source lighting these values up. In this example we have the light on the top right side. It shifts all the value distribution to a diagonal line from the top right to the top left. We will paint these heads in exercise videos later, but for now we will just cover it as a quick example. 
but these are so important to practice yourself to know how the values are distributed on a human head under different lighting scenarios. Here we have the same situation but from the right side. The only difference here is the background is in black, so the light and the shadow will be more intense than before. The same value distribution happens but this time from the right to the left. In this last example we have the light hitting from the bottom and all the surface facing it will be a high value, while the ones turning away from it will be in the dark. The reason why the shadows here are very dark is that the ground no longer acts like a second light source and there isn't a surface on the top to reflect any light back onto these surfaces. So those were simple examples to investigate. You won't be drawing basic shapes all the time, so let's look at more master artist paintings and professional artist work to see how those artists manipulated the direction of the light to tell a story using only the values resulting from that factor. Okay, so here we have this concept art painting. I'm not good with pronouncing names, so I'm going to leave the name of the artist on the bottom corner. So if you want to check them out, go right ahead. We will also ignore all the colors in these examples and focus only on the values. In this painting, we see how the direction of the light shifts the eye of the viewer toward the subject of the painting. In all of this library and its tons of details, the first thing you look at is the man holding the book. The reason is the direction of the light makes this area of the painting in full contrast. The contrast of the dark clothes of the man we are seeing from behind and the light of the floor reflecting the sunlight. I have added more modifiers to distinguish the differences between each painting example I'm showing here. On the top we see the value range this painting is using and it's using almost a full range from the light value of 2 all the way to 9. But most of the contrasted values are in the tiny area caused by the direction of the sunlight. On the top left we can see the value levels taken from Photoshop. In this chart we can see how most of the values are shifted toward the dark. We have only 5% of light, 25% midtones, and almost 100% in some areas that are completely in dark tones. So this painting is mostly a low key painting. We will be discussing the meaning of low and high key paintings a bit later, but for now this painting is mainly in low key with a mid contrast overall. That means it's a low contrast everywhere except in the focal point, where it's a high contrast between the subject and the surrounding area. Underneath the chart here, I have lowered the value of the painting to three values, light, dark, and midtone. And you can see clearly the effect of the direction of the light on the painting. It's mostly dark, except where you need to look. Under that we see the first and the second light bounces in the scene. Light bounces at the movement of the light photons at the painting. The first bounce is simply the light coming through the windows and hitting the floors. That's the first light bounce, and you can see the full impact of the light in that area the lightest values in the painting. From there we can see the second light bounces from the floor to everywhere else. The closest the object is to the light zone, the lighter it will be. So we can see that the wall near the light spot will be the lightest compared to the wall on the far side, cause light decay with distance. A sunlight won't decay on the first bounce, but from there it will start decaying as it hits more surfaces. A light bulb would decay from the first bounce, depending on its distance from the object. Ok, let's look at another example. Here we have another low-key mid-contrast painting with a very obvious direction of light. But this time it's not a sunlight, it's a projector light. It's not the only light source as well in the scene. We can see the effect of the light source from the left, but we will ignore that for now. We have a full value scale here as well, and the lightest values are where the projector light is hitting. It automatically focuses your eye toward the goal of this painting, to look at the entrance door in the center of the painting. Most of the contrast in this value we see are in between the hot spot and the surrounding dark area. If you check the light value of the columns, you will see it's around 2 or even 3 in value. So it's not an absolute white, but it looks like it is due to the darkness of its surrounding. So you don't need to apply the lightest light to make things bright, you just need to darken the surrounding area around it. On the top left we see the value chart, which is similar to the one before, with 3% light, 20% midtones and the rest in dark tones. The direction of the light is starting from the projector to the right, hitting the left side of the door. We can follow the light impact to see where the first light bounce is. It's hitting the closed columns around the door, as well as the left side of the door. The second light bounce is from there to the surrounding area. But here we have less of a bounce from the projector light than from a sunlight that we saw before, for two reasons. 
The power of the projector is nowhere near the sunlight, and the light objects reflect more of the light hitting them than dark objects. So the door is being a dark tone won't reflect as much as a shiny floor in the previous example. The only light objects here reflecting the light are the columns, and it's not too much to reflect. Ok, moving on to the next example. In this painting we have a directional sunlight coming from the top left hitting the statue of the dragon in the middle along with the character near it. It also uses a full value scale range from light to the dark tones, but this time we have a mid-key painting. It's not fully dark or fully light, but somewhere in between, with a little bit of more toward the dark values. If we look at the value chart, we see the values are mostly in between the dark and the mid-tones, with some spikes in the highlights around the statue. The direction of the light, as I mentioned, is from the top left, and the direct impact is at the dragon statue and the character near it. And it also hitting the building in the front. From there we can see the light hitting the ground and reflecting on the other statue and with a lesser degree the vehicle on the left. Here we have a great master artist painting. George de la Tour, a Baroque style French painter who was just a master of light and values. His paintings are absolutely beautiful. That you can actually feel that there is a light source in the canvas itself. In this painting he uses a full range of values from absolute white to absolute dark. But the painting itself is a very low key painting with it being almost all in the dark except a single candle emitting a faint light source on the top right corner of the golden ratio composition. If we look at the value chart we can obviously see most of the values are at the far corner of the dark tone with barely a 1% light in all of the painting. The light here is only to guide the viewer toward the focal point of the painting. Even though it's a candlelight, which is an undirectional omni-light source, it's still directing the focus around it toward the subject in hand. If we look at the area around the candle, it's a very contrasted zone between the absolute dark background and the absolute lightened face of the child, the forehead of the old man, and best of the arms as well. The first light bounce is just the sphere around the candle. But beyond it, we see how the light bounces around, showing faint details from the floor, the tools on the floor, and the body of both characters. It's a great way to use the direction of the light to captivate your viewers into looking to whatever you want. In this example, we have a legendary piece from the one and only Michelangelo. This one is called The Calling of Saint Matthew, a beautiful lesson in light and values from the master himself. It can't get any better in using the direction of the light to tell your story. Here we have a low-key painting, almost entirely dark except the faces and bits of the clothes of the characters. He doesn't use the full range here, it's mostly mid-tones and dark values. Even the whitest whites here are a value of 2 or 3, and it's mainly in 1 or 2 spots. But due to the overall darkness, you can almost see it in complete white values. This contrast between the dark and high midtones turns this painting into a low-key, high-contrasted painting. And as if the light direction isn't enough to point your view toward the focal point, look at all the hand gesture. It's just amazing. The first light bounce is a direct hit from the light source on the right, hitting the faces of the characters. But then the light bounces around in a lesser mid-tone values to show a bit more information for the rest of the scene, including the table, the floor, and the clothes. And that's it for these examples. But before we move on from the direction of the light factor, let's look at the full range of direction and how they affect the same Asaro head we talked about before. If we look at every one of them, we see that the direction of the light tells a different story in each one of them. From the inner set and angelic look of the light from above, to the sinister look of the light from below, to the mysterious rim light from behind or to the side. And here we can see how the values changes from one direction to the other. The full impact of the light ray hits the surface that are directly facing the light source, and it gets lower and lower from there. Ok, for the final part to finish off the first factor of light that affects values, I'm gonna do a quick example painting the light on a simple object. Now these are just simple examples and exercises to start with before we go into more complicated examples later in the exercise videos. So in this example I'm gonna paint this basic geosphere. Geospheres are kind of an Asaro head version for the sphere. You can see the planes of the sphere instead of the smooth surface. This will help with painting values in a more expressive way showing exactly what we talked about so far. In this first example we have the light coming from the top right angle. 
For start, we can treat the geosphere as a normal sphere and layer the values from the light to dark depending on the direction of the light source. We can do that by applying the lightest values to the surface facing the light source. So from the top right, we can see that the surfaces are pointing at the light source so we can apply the light value there. And as the sphere surfaces turn away, it's where things get darker and darker till they go completely in the shadow. Between the two areas, we have the line that separates the light from the shadows. This is where most of the details will be. It will be more visible on the geosphere than a normal sphere, since nothing is smoothed out here. Sometimes you have two faces that are in the same area of the light, but one is a bit more turned away, like 5 or 10 degrees more than the other surface, and that will show in a slightly darker value. That's why you see that almost every triangle has its own value, because every triangle has its own angle. And here it is, very neat little exercise to do. You can see the bands of light showing the direction of the light source. Even if you hide the light source, you can still tell by looking at the values of the sphere where the light source was. The most tricky surfaces were the two triangles in the middle, because they can go both ways. If the light source is to the background, they will be dark. And if the light source is more toward us, they will be lighter. Okay, let's do another one. This time the light is directly above the sphere. And straight away I do the layers of the values as if it's a normal sphere. Just keeping in mind the triangular property of the geosphere. So the top triangles will be the lightest, the middle will be the darkest, and the bottom ones should be even darker. But due to the light hitting the ground and reflecting back to the sphere, they are a slightly bit lighter than the midsection. But remember that no matter how light the floor is, they will never be as light as the triangles on the top under the direct first light bounce. Secondary bounces always have less energy and carry less light than the first bounces, because light decay the more it bounces around. And here it is, done in 5 minutes or so. Now let's do another one. Here the light is from the bottom left. And we do the same process, separate the surface in bands of values depending on the direction of the light first. Then start observing the angles of the surface normal and adjust the values accordingly. Keep in mind that there are many other factors that affect your values that still will come later, like ambient inclusion, ambient light, secondary light sources, reflected light and many many more.
and it's done. Let's move on to the next. This time the light is from the bottom. The sphere here is sitting on the light source, so it will be the same as the one from the top, but upside down. Also, there will be no reflected light from the top, so the top here will be the absolute darkest, not the middle, like the other one. By the way, there is an optical illusion in the middle. The middle part of the mid section is actually lighter than the middle part of the upper section. But you see them both almost the same, or even the other way around, because the top part is surrounded by dark values, making them look lighter, and the bottom part is surrounded by light values, making them look darker. In reality, the bottom is lighter than the top part. Okay, let's do one last example before we move on to the second factor. Here we have the light coming from behind the object. It will look like a rim light on both sides of the sphere, while the mid section will be the darkest part of it. Since the light isn't showing behind the sphere, even the lightest part of it won't be as light as the direct hit in the previous example. It will be mostly in a high mid-tone section, but not a highlight. The only highlight will be at the edge of the sphere due to the materials of the sphere. Something we're gonna talk about more when we get to the differences in materials and how that affects values. It's mainly something to do with the Fresnel effect, but more on that later. And here are all the examples side by side. And that was the final example of 20 showing the effect of light direction on your values. Let's now move on to the next factor, the weather and the time of day. We talked about the weather and the time of day in the first lesson, but now we're gonna see more examples on it. The weather and time of day affect values in both exterior and interior scenes. Landscape in nighttime will be obviously different than the one in the daytime. Same with summer time versus winter time. In this example, we can see the column being hit in a clear summer day at daytime. Every part of the column is being hit at a certain angle resulting in a different value like we saw before. That's the direction factor. But as for the weather and time, these values will change as time changes and the sun position change with it. Same thing with weather. In a sunny day, there will be a visible direct sunlight. While in a cloudy day, the sun direction will be more of an ambient light hitting from all directions due to the sunlight being scattered by the clouds. In this example, we see the same effect on the Astaro head. Here we have it in a clear day with the sun hitting from the top right. The difference between this and the previous example in the direction factor is the ambient light hitting from all around and lighting up the values that was once darker without an ambient light. And here is the same example in a cloudy day with the light scattering all over the head and almost equalizing all the values around the mid-tone value. So in both situations, the weather and time factor in changing the values of your painting, something you can use later to tell a story using the light and values. Let's look at some example on weather and time and how they factor in affecting the values. Here we have a great painting in a different time, weather and lighting situation. We're gonna look at each one and how they affect the values in the painting. In the first one here, we don't have any light source in the painting. It's just the basic colors and values of the object and the character in the scene. The reason why I included it first, to show how basic values react to different light sources. So in the following examples, you can come back to this and see how the weather and time change these basic values according to the new light condition. So now we can see what adding a light source do to these basic values, especially how the different weather and time would factor in these values. For the first example, we have a direct sunlight coming from the top right angle. You can see how it highlights everywhere the light first bounces and then lighten up all the surrounding area by the secondary bounces. The painting turned to a mid key with high contrast, especially between the light and shadow around the character. Also, all the shadows are sharp and precise due to the clear sky and the direct position of the sun. 
You can see the value chart where we have a balance between the three lights, midtones, and dark values. Even though the dark value is higher, it doesn't go all the way to black, so it's mainly dark midtone. And we can also see the position of the light and the first bounces of the light rays. In the second example, we have a cloudy day, so the sun is still showing from above, but no obvious direct light in it like before. So you can consider all the light hitting the scene as a secondary bounces hitting all over the place. The value range shrank toward the higher midtones all the way to dark midtones. Both ends of the value range disappear when the light isn't as contrasted or intense as with the direct light source. We can also see the value chart and how the values are pulling around the midtones with some highlights and dark values. So on a cloudy day we can consider the painting is done in mid key and in mid contrast. Next we have a sunset, a clear day with the sun at an angle, resulting in a low key mid contrast painting. The intensity of the sun here isn't as high as the mid noon sun, so the value will be a bit darker, especially in the shadow areas. The sun direction is behind the character, near the horizon, which add a rim light effect around the character with the lightest tone in the painting. And here we have a night shot. The light is no longer coming from the sun, but from artificial light source. In this case, three different ceiling lights. And there is also a faint moonlight coming from the top right side. Here the painting is in a low key and a mid contrast. The value used here are few highlights around the focal point and the rest is mid tones and dark tones. The artificial ceiling light don't affect the character that much since they are omni light. They only affect the area around them and on the floor, while the moonlight focuses the highest contrast values around the character. In the final example, the artist turned it into a fantasy painting, using the light from the sun but moving the whole scene underwater. Here we have something called caustics. We talked about caustic in the previous lesson. Just as a reminder, caustic are the indirect illumination that happens when light reflects from another surface. In this case, it's reflecting off the surface of the sea toward our scene. So here we have something similar to God rays coming from the top right and also artificial lights in the ceiling and glowing orbs all around. The value range will have both very bright highlights and very dark shadows, ending up with a low key painting and a high contrast tones. Also we have caustic highlights moving around the scene along with the surface of the sea. One painting, six different values, contrast and key changing with weather, time of day and the environmental condition. Well that was fun to do, let's see another example, also focusing on weather and time of day. In this example we have a landscape painted around 12 pm. We have the same one as sunset, and finally at night. Same landscape, different weather and time. Let's focus on values and talk about colors later in its own chapter. In the daytime painting, we see a wide range of value, painted in low key. Even that it's a high noon here, there's still more dark than light, which makes it a low key painting. If you have 75% darks and 25% light, that would make it a low key painting. The other way around would make it a high key painting, and anywhere in between would be a mid key painting. It's also a high contrast painting, seeing how the light and dark are close together, showing shapes in precise manner. The direction of the light is high above, almost perpendicular on the ground. The values here are separated into dark foreground, mid-tone mid-ground, and light background. In the second example we have a sunset, and a lower sun position behind the clouds around the horizon. This results in a mid-key painting and a mid-key contrast. But even with that, the artist still preserve the same values for background, mid-ground, and foreground, just in different value scales. We can also see the value chart that the tones are mostly in the middle, no sharp highlights or shadows. In the final example we have a nighttime painting with the moon acting as the light source here. Now with much less intensity than the sun, we have a rim light effect on the object in the scene. The values are mostly in the dark tones except for the moon and its reflection, turning it into a low key painting with a low contrast except for the character and the moon, making them the focal point of the painting. But even still the three values of the background, foreground and midground remain the same. Before we finish up the weather and time factor, let's go back to the same example we did before and do one for the direct light in the clear day and another one for the cloudy day. So this would basically look the same one like we did before for the direct light, but the difference will be that there is no decaying light source like before and much more ambient light hitting the other side of the sphere, giving it more of a mid-tone value to the other side of the sphere making the darkest values to be in the middle toward the back and underneath the sphere, with a very sharp shadow to the opposite side.
In the cloudy condition example, we have the ambient light acting as the main source, but it's reflecting and bouncing all around the sphere and the ground, resulting in a very light overall tone and shrinking the shadow to the main ambient occlusion underneath the sphere. Also, the shadow here will be very blurry, unlike the sunlight example since there is no direct light source in the scene. And there they are, all the examples side by side. These are the final example of 15 showing the effect of weather and time on your values. Let's now move on to the next factor, light intensity and light decay. Light intensity is another major factor in controlling the values of your painting. The intensity of the light source will affect how light is your lightest tones and how dark is your darkest tone and everything in between. The closer the object to your light source, the more contrasted and high key the values will be. And the further away the light source is, the less contrasted and low key the values will be. This is especially visible with the artificial light source. The sunlight won't decay on the surface of the earth no matter how far it goes, but artificial light sources all have a decay distance where the intensity of the light fade away bit by bit till it can no longer be seen. For example, a candlelight won't shine as far as a light bulb, and the light bulb won't shine as far as a light projector, and so on. So let's see the effect of light intensity on values. Here in this example, as before, we have the same light direction as we have before with 100% of the same intensity as before. And just like before, we have the mid section being hit by a zero angle of the light ray, resulting in a value of 2. 4 for the top part at 45 degrees and 6 at the lower part hitting at 60 degrees. So nothing changed here. Let's now lower the intensity of the light to 50%, dimming it down and removing almost half of the light rays hitting the surface. And right away we see the values of the object going down to a value of 5 for the next section, going down from 2. And a 7 for the top part going down from 5 and an 8 for the lower part going down from 6. It won't be a 1 to 1 ratio with the light, so it doesn't mean that if the light source went 50%, the value will go all the way from 2 to 4. It has to do with the basic values and the surrounding of the object itself. If this was a dark value object, it will range between a value of 8 and 9. If this was a white object, it will range between 3 and 5, and so on. Now let's turn on the intensity to 200%. Same effect but in the opposite direction. There are so many light rays hitting the object that it turns it almost to a light value object. Now, I said before that the contrast increases when the light source is near, but it completely goes away if the intensity is this high. If the intensity stays at 100% and the light source just got closer to the object, the contrast would be higher than before. But here the position is the same, only the intensity got higher. So the mesh section is at zero value, which is absolute white. The top part is at 2 instead of 4, and the lower part is at 3 instead of 6. So it's all in high tones now due to the increase of light intensity. Now let's see the same effect the light intensity have on the Astaro head. On the normal 100% intensity, we basically have the same effect as before, but with the addition of the ambient light. Ambient light will raise all the values up in comparison to the black background. So since this is the white statue, we will reach the value of 0, which is absolute white, toward the top right area of the head, and 5 to 6 in the shadow area. If we lower the intensity of the sun to 50% as in a sunset or a sunrise, the whole value range will shift downward toward the midtones, and the absolute white will turn into a 3, which is a high midtone, and the shadow area can go all the way to 9 or 10. On the opposite side, let's say on Venus for example, the sun looked twice as big, and thus the statue will be almost burnt out, and the whole right side will look in absolute white, and the darkest shadows will be in mid 5 to 6. So not only the direction of the light will affect your values, but the intensity and the distance to the light source as well. Okay, let's do some master art examples now, just like before, starting with this one. 
Here we have a very intense light coming from the windows in the background, all the way to the left, turning this painting into a high key painting with a mid-range contrast. Here we have absolute whites on the bright areas and around 6 or 7 value for the darkest dark. And the amount of bright areas are around 75% and maybe less than 25% are in the shadows. That's why it's a high key painting. High intensity light source would usually render a painting in a high key unless it's a small source. As for the contrast, it will depend on the size and distance of the light source. A big and close intense light source would have a lower contrast than a small and distance intense light source. Speaking of the intense small light source, here we have a very small one hitting only the side of this woman, resulting in a low key painting. Now I know I said high intense light source would usually result in a high key painting, but since this is a small source, it only affects a small area of the painting. The small area will be in a high key, but since there isn't another source to affect the rest, the amount of darks are much higher in total than the lights, making this a low key painting, but high contrast in return. The contrast of course, as we said, due to the size and distance of the light source. These kind of paintings are dramatic, interesting, and intriguing to look at. Here we have another Michelangelo masterpiece with a very high contrast painting. It almost looked like a photograph. But even with a high intensity light source coming from the top left, there is too much dark in the picture rendering it into a low key high contrast painting. Just like the one before. And as I said, this type of paintings are very intriguing and exciting to look at. It's kind of what Rembrandt was all about. Focusing the attention of the viewer to one single area of interest. That can be achievable with the correct light type and intensity. We have another master artist work here and this time we have Raphael. This is called the Transfiguration Painting. His last painting ever. And it's insane. It has so many elements in it I can make a whole video on it. It's almost split in half with a high key in the top and a low key in the bottom showing the difference in condition between life and afterlife or life and death. The light source in the top part shine all over the painting with a high intensity. The darkness still overwhelms in the painting so it's still a low key painting but the contrast is as high as ever. Another low key high contrast painting. You can see why artists love this combination. It's very exciting to behold. And the final example, and it's about time to talk about it, is the master of this style himself, Mr. Rambra. In this painting, we do have a very faint and hidden light source as a candlelight. The brilliance of hiding the light source and showing its effect on the surrounding areas is just very pleasing to look at. The candlelight isn't a very intense light source, so it's not a high contrasted painting, but it's a low key for sure. The whole value range between the mid tones all the way to the dark tones. Only a few highlights that are in the 3 or 2 and a half values, showing on key places to guide the viewer eye to look at that direction. Contrast, hard edges, details, all these focal points make a painting very dynamic and interesting to look at. Alright and this is it for the master painting examples, let's look at the same old exercise we did before but now with more intensity. I'm going to do 4 examples with 4 different light sizes and intensity. The first one here is the small light source with 25% intensity. The object itself is a grey midtone value sphere in all examples. So here we have a very faint small light shining on the top right edge of the sphere. Even though the sphere is grey, there is no other light source to show any of its feature except the faint light. So here the value will shift downward toward the dark values. The highlights will start from 6 or 7 and the shadows will be in absolute black. Even though it's too hard to tell, you can still see the differences in values in between the layers of the sphere. Just because it's hard to tell doesn't mean you shouldn't add them. The more details you add, the more interesting your paintings will be. Ok let's make the light source a bit bigger, now to a medium size and an intensity of 50%. Now the value scale shifts a bit upward and the highlights will start from 4 to 5 and the shadows can still go all the way to black or maybe 9.
Now with a big light source and a 100% intensity, we will see the object as it should be seen, a mid-tone sphere with a light shining on it. We will see a full range of values from highlights to dark shadows according to the direction of the light source. This is the default lighting situation to show the best of your object. Not much drama in it, just a very basic and technical lighting situation. In the last example we have a huge light source and almost 200% intensity. This is where your painting shifts toward the high key area. All your values will start from the absolute whites all the way to mid-tones shadows. And here are all the 4 examples side by side. And with that, we end all the 15 examples on intensity and how it can affect your values very much in every situation. Uh, just before I end this uh, video, I don't know if you saw my post earlier. Uh, I have been uh, hit with a ransomware and they encrypted all my files for uh, everything I had for the past 20 years. So. Uh, I was planning to release the exercise video along with this one, but time-wise I was just trying to stop the hacking as much as I can because they didn't just encrypt all my files, they also uh, took all my passwords. Uh, they took my uh, Amazon account and they tried to sign in every single email I have. Um, so it's been like a battle for the past week or so. It started at the 3rd of July and it's still going on till this day to be honest. So the exercise video is going to take uh, a bit more and the rest of this uh, lesson is going to take a while. I was planning to finish all of it in a week or two but now it may take more than that. So I just wanted to let you know what happened uh, and why it may take a bit longer. But uh, for now let's just end this video and hopefully I will finish the first part of the exercise video probably it will be on Monday. 
So uh, yeah, that's all. So back to the video. It's funny that when I started this lesson, I thought it will be one lesson video and one exercise video. I just realized this lesson cannot fit in one video anymore. So it's gonna be four lecture videos and five different exercise videos as I mentioned before. So from two videos to nine. This whole lesson turned into its own series. I guess this is better. Uploading four or five hours lecture would really be annoying to everyone. And I don't think that it's even possible on my connection. So I will stop the video here and continue on the next video. So no homework or outro right now, but we will do the outro in the last part of the video of this lecture. So on part four. So with that, this is it for this video. I will see you in part two of this lecture. So see you there.